Have you ever been part of a bad worship service? Maybe it was the music that was bad or the preaching that was bad or a whole number of other reasons. Well, today on the Digging Deeper podcast, we're going to talk about um, everything that God looks for in worship and for our Bad Doctrine of the Week, it involves tambourines. What does that mean? I don't know. We'll find out today on the Digging Deeper podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the Digging Deeper podcast, where our goal is to dig into that week's sermon a little bit deeper, so that way we might dig it a little bit deeper into our hearts. We're glad they all joined us. My name is Chris Brown, and I'm the associate pastor here at First Baptist Azel. My name is Jacob Belding. I'm the connections minister here at First Baptist Azel. Uh Uh-huh. And today on sound, we have... No one. No one. (laughs) We don't have anyone on sound today. (laughs) Uh, Judah was busy today, so he couldn't make it. So hopefully, all this sounds okay. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna find out all together. Um, but That's right. It should be good. Um, all right. Well, before I forget, if you haven't, go ahead and subscribe and like and comment and do all those things down below. That just tells the algorithm of Facebook and YouTube and whatever that you like this content and that you want to see more of it. And we just like to hear from you. It's always fun to hear you. Uh, you know, share your thoughts on what we're talking about. And so. So, yeah, feel free to share that below. We'd love to, to see what you think. All right, Jacob, this past Sunday, Pastor Lee taught on bad worship. Yes, he did. <laughs> uh, just to clarify, he uh-huh. talked about really bad worship. Really bad worship. <laughs> it's not just bad worship. Right. It's really, really. bad worship. And before you... Uh, get into what you think that might be, uh, he's more approaching it from how God views worship, not how we view worship. Now, we're going to talk all about how we view bad worship. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Um, But that's not really what Lee is going at. Lee is more approaching it from how does God view worship and what is bad worship whenever we're offering it up to God. That's kind of the the premise of uh, the whole sermon. And so, he goes into um, three three points um, of what bad worship is. And uh, those three points are bad worship focuses on self rather than God. Bad worship focuses on experience rather than God. And bad worship is crazy worship. (laughs) What does that mean? We're going to figure that out as we go. Um, But he uses a a number of different texts, but his opening text is in uh, Isaiah 1. But before we get too deep into that, have you ever been part of a bad worship service? Absolutely. Yeah. Do you have uh, one that comes to your mind? Um, You know, there's there's not one that just sticks out. Um, One of the things that Pastor Lee talked about early on was... uh, you know, being a kid, there's not children's church, mm-hmm. and just being bored out of your mind. Uh, I do remember; I have a very distinct memory uh, growing up in church. It was uh, you know, at the very beginning of the service, after uh, a song or two, you know, the pastor would have all the kids come up to the front and would do kind of like a mini kids lesson. And then, if you were four and five, you got to go to children's church. Everybody else went back to their uh, moms and dads there mm-hmm. in the pews. And so, uh, I was at the age where I, I wasn't going to children's church, and so my parents uh, had things for us to do, like pages that we could write on or color on or whatever. And uh, I remember one time, it was a really quiet part during the sermon, and for some reason I thought it'd be a good idea to like tear this page. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't remember why I did it, but I did it, and it was probably the loudest. It was like a sonic boom Mm -hmm. because it was a Mm -hmm. quiet part. Mm -hmm. And oh man, I got, uh, you know, the death stare (laughs) uh, from my parents that time. Yeah. I remember uh, we didn't have children's church growing up either. And uh, yeah, so I'd have to sit with my mom and I would just sit and lay on her side or something and I would just play with her hand and whatnot. And I would remember thinking to myself, I'd be like, who listens to the sermon? <laughs> like, what are we doing here? <laughs> um, and then uh, whenever there was like music, uh, back in the old days when they would put the order of service in the Bolton, um, I would like check off yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. all the stuff. So I, I was like counting down to when I was done. Right. Um, the but, stuff wasn't necessarily bad. I was just a kid. Yeah, and, that's right. Yeah. And, you know, for the record, I know this is a really big deal, especially for Baptists, but I think it might have been even in response to that because we were sitting kind of in that front section. It was a bigger church. 
and uh, we were sitting kind of close-ish to the front, maybe 10 pews back or so in the very front middle section. Then after that, we started sitting in the balcony of the church. (laughs) (laughs) So they're like, man, drastic times and kids being a little, uh, you know, know, distracting calls for drastic measures. We have to change our spot. Yeah, maybe it was a church discipline thing. (laughs) Maybe the the pastor came up and said, you can't sit here anymore. Listen, you have to forfeit your spot. Uh, You must go now sit in the balcony. Yes. You know, if you sit in the balcony... You know, you're closer to God anyway, so yeah. it worked yeah, out you're for just us. Like. Twenty feet closer. <laughs> uh, I remember um, when I was uh, I was leading worship for a church in college, and we were doing this like bluegrass song, and I, I was leading the music. And uh, mid song, we were supposed to change keys. Oh um, no! And we had practiced it and told everyone, "Hey, this is where we're changing keys in the song. This is what's going on." Then we get to the actual service and we're playing it. I change keys. No one else changes keys. <laughs> and so we got the band is playing two different keys at the same time. And it's just this wall of noise oh. uh, coming out. And we actually had to stop. Yeah. We, we Like, I, I was leading, and I just stopped the whole band. I was like, hey, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> we we messed up as a band. Uh, let's try that again. And so uh, you know it's always good whenever the music has to come to a halt mid-service oh, yeah. and start over. Um, it's rough. Yeah. But yeah. It, it was probably the right call. It probably sounded like an upset stomach <laughs> with, yes. with the two different keys oh. going on. Oh, yeah. And and we're, uh, you know, we're going to, you know, talk about everything that God views as good worship. And ideally, <laughs> we should view the same thing. Uh, however, we are fallen human beings and sometimes things distract <laughs> yes. um, and, and we're going to talk about all that but first let's get into like what god views as good worship or uh really bad worship yeah. um those two so so pastor lee um starts us off in isaiah 1 do you want to just go ahead and, and read that passage yep isaiah 1 verses 15 through 17 when you spread out your hands i will hide my eyes from you even though you make many prayers i will not listen Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Yeah, and so what this shows us um, right out the gate is that there are times that God does not want our worship. Yeah. Yeah, Uh, and, and that sounds like contrary to our thinking. Our our thinking is like, no matter where we're at, we can come to God and and do all that. But this is one of those times where God is like, no, like, like you can do all these things. I'm not going to hear it. I'm not going to see it. I want no part of this Mm -hmm. at all. And this isn't just in Isaiah. We see this all throughout um, the Old Testament, uh, particularly in the prophets, Mm -hmm. where they're calling uh, uh, Israel to repentance. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of a recurring theme of of your worship is doing nothing right now. That's right. Um, because, it's not acceptable. Yeah. Um, but uh, l- let's go ahead. And th- th- so that's kind of the the foundation of it all is that there are times that God does not accept our worship. Mm. And so so as we dig into the sermon, we're going to look, uh, or Pastor Lee looks more into uh, where what are those times yeah. that God does not accept our worship. Okay, and point number one is uh, bad worship focuses on self rather than God. It focuses on ourself yes. rather than God. Any uh, thoughts? Oh, man. Uh, this one's tough. Uh, and, and this is really a uh, – the point is really a common theme, like you said, uh, mm-hmm. even throughout uh, the Old Testament. So, uh, I mean, everything, if you think about it, out in the world is really tailored to us – to uh, ourselves, to what it is that we want. So, like, think of any commercial, right? Or mm-hmm. I don't know if – does anybody watch commercials anymore? Or is it really just ads? Ads. Yeah, ads. Yeah. Uh, like, the kids, my kids, they don't have any idea what a commercial is. They're like, oh, we hate these ads. Yeah, right. Um, mm-hmm. But it's even – think of commercials or ads. It's all – designed to, you know, present their whatever product or whatever it is that they're selling as something, oh, this is going to help you. It's going to benef- mm-hmm. benefit you, right? And obviously the point is you spend your money to get that product and somehow, you know, you're doing better because of it, right? Mm-hmm. You're better off after you buy whatever it is than than before. So really uh, a lot of the things in the world 
just by their nature, are really self-driven. Yeah, and that can really creep itself into oh, yeah. the doctrine of the church, right? Like, everything is about us, so then when we come into worship, it just slowly morphs into it's about us. Right. Um, did you see, um, there's this famous clip that went around of, uh, what's Joel Osteen's wife's name? Do you know? Oh, um, um. I can't remember I, her name. Anyways, uh, did, did you see that clip? I don't guess so. So, so there's this clip of her and Joel Osteen um, at their church, and they're given this kind of like call to worship kind of thing. And uh, she says something along the lines of like, hey, as we move into worship, um, I, w- I want you to, to consider that, that um, we worship God, but it's not really about God. It's about you and about you being happy or, or something like that. Like, it's a loose paraphrase, but it's one of the wildest things. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it, it like went viral because everyone's like, what did she just say? It was basically because it's basically saying like, hey, when we worship God, it's not really about God. It's about us because God wants us to be happy. And it's like, whoa, whoa, no, no, no. <laughs> I think the Apostle Paul would have a thing or two to say about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. Wow. And so that that's just that's an extreme example, right? Um, and I imagine even maybe even Joel after that one was like, "Hey, let's uh, you know, walk this let's one back. Walk that one bit. back." I, I think you may have like got caught up in the moment and said something you shouldn't have said, um, because that's a, a pretty wild one. I, even the most liberal person would probably not go that far yeah. with it. But the idea of that does come into this of like worship is about ourselves and. And we see that all the time and like what makes us upset about churches and about worship services and stuff like, you know. Music. Yeah. It's not the right music that I want. It's not the type of preaching that I want. You know, it's a little too cold. It's a little too hot. Um, you know, people didn't greet me whenever I came in. People talked to me too much when I came in. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. It's like it's it's basically turned into kind of a consumeristic yeah. mindset. Of of how like as I'm shopping churches and, and I I don't I use that term not tongue in cheek like literally as I right. shop churches to to decide which one fits me um, I'm looking for which one is going to serve my preferences and my needs yeah. best um, which isn't you know it, it's not a bad thing to like look at what church is going to um, uh, fit the needs of your family but that shouldn't be the core right. thing that you're looking for like the core thing that you should be looking for in worship and in uh, church is like is this church like grounded in biblical doctrine are they worshiping god are they following god all those things mm-hmm. that's first yeah and then we can look into okay how do my f- kids fit in here right. you know so on and so forth yeah absolutely that that's got to be Prime really, it starts with scripture mm-hmm. uh, and, and the primary place of scripture, and then yeah, everything else flows directly from that, right? High yeah. view of scripture usually leads to other uh, the other good things, mm-hmm. right? That aren't bad, yeah. like having an awesome kids ministry, for example. It's not a bad thing, mm-hmm. right? But if you have an awesome kids program, but scripture's not first, well, are you really benefiting then? Yeah, in the way that the we kids are having a good time. Believers. Yeah, but are they really getting anything right. from that? Right, exactly. Um, at that point, is a glorified club. Yeah, uh, or a hangout time. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and so, so one of the things that we have to to ask ourselves is, um, as we come into worship service, whatever is like frustrating us, whatever's you know taking our attention off the worship, we got to ask ourselves: Am I placing too much importance on that to the detriment of? my worship to God, mm-hmm. right? And, and I, I kind of wonder, like, you know, worship today looks a lot different than worship in the Old Testament yeah. uh, because, you know, they go to the temple and offer their sacrifices and whatnot. But I wonder if they got distracted the same way that we did. Uh, uh, I'm sure they did. Yeah, I mean, like d- they walk in and they're like, oh, that priest isn't wearing the right tassels or, <laughs> or whatnot. <laughs> uh, or uh, just logistically, especially if they're uh, if they're gathering you know, at the temple, maybe they've traveled a long way. Mm-hmm. Um, probably not. I would imagine they're probably tired. You know, especially oh, yeah. the further mm-hmm. way that they've had to travel. Um, you know, thinking about travel plans going back. Thinking about, I'm sure they thought about what was for lunch. You know, mm-hmm. right. even those sorts of things. Well, and that kind of gets into uh, Isaiah 29:13. But mm-hmm. uh, Lee reads this uh, passage. It says, "The Lord says, these people." 
come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And so that gets into that very thing of like, yeah. you know, you know, they they come in and they're doing their, their duties or whatever they're supposed to do. Um, but everything in the heart's just completely somewhere else. Mm. And man, do we do that all the time, yeah. right? Like we're like singing, you know, like, what are we going to do after the service? Where are we going to go eat? What are we doing tonight? Oh, I need to go do this. I need to go do this. And so like we're singing the words and we're part of the corporate worship, but our minds and our hearts are just somewhere else. Right, right. right. Uh, or even, um, you know, if during the week, and this even gets back into uh, the initial passage that we read, uh, even if if during the week we're, we're not uh, walking uh, in the way that we should, if we're uh, will, especially willfully sinning, um, then, you know, it's hard to imagine coming in Sunday morning after, like, let's say you're at work and you um, you get into a spat with a coworker or just treat them poorly or you know, mm-hmm. whatever, um, and you come into worship Sunday morning and say, you know, God, I love you so much. It's like, is that acceptable worship? You know, Jesus actually brought that up. I know. Do you remember? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, he said, if if you have an offering to present to the Lord, but you have an issue with your brother leave the offering, go take care of that, then come back. Yeah. And it's this, you know, this very same thing that you're talking about of like, um, there are things that put walls between us and God. Mm-hmm. And that is particularly sin. If we have sin against God, we need to rectify that. We can't just pretend it's not there. Right. Uh, if we have sin with other people, um, we need to rectify that. We can't yeah. just pretend it's not there. Um, we, we come to God with our hearts, meaning repentant. Right. right, repentant and humble before God, and if we're just throwing that out the door, then it's just lip service, right? Right, or even just checking a box, yeah. Right, like, oh, I went to church Sunday, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'm I'm good. I did my worship time, and then go right back to you know everyday life, yeah. and there's no worship that sort of permeates our lives. That's a problem. Mm-hmm. And God goes far enough. No, uh, I'm not sure about in Isaiah, but in Malachi, God addressing this exact issue goes far enough to say, you might as well close the doors. Mm-hmm. You might as well just not even show up. Right. You would be better off staying home than coming here. Um, now, come to church. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> come to church. I would rather you be repentant and come to church. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, but it's a very real thing that if if you are living a life of unrepentance, uh, running away from God, and you're just coming there and giving lip service to God, don't fool yourself. It's not doing anything. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so, it's basically keeping the focus on God and off of yourself. He mentions um, Paul uh, from last week. Uh about how he was in prison and about how Paul could be focused on all these different struggles and things, but he's not. He's focused on God. It's like God is the center of it all. And it's interesting that whenever you keep the focus on God, all of a sudden, all these things that used to bother us don't bother us quite as much anymore, yeah, right? That's right. Yeah. It's like yeah I thought. Philippians 4.13, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's it. Yeah. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? And he's, right. that's precisely what he's talking about mm-hmm. is... Uh, you know, despite all of his circumstances and where he is and, the, you know, the things that he's experiencing, um, it's okay. Uh, he he has uh, God in his proper place as uh, the first priority in his life. He's he's following, he's focused on, on the Lord rather than on himself, and it's through Christ that he can do all these things. Mm-hmm. Um, right, less about, you know, how fast he can run and... You know, mm-hmm. or I can do all things. <laughs> yeah, right. It's all about uh, lifting weights. <laughs> the 72 ounce steak challenge. I guess I can do all things. <laughs> do all things to Christ who strengthens me. Um, yes, yes. Okay. Anyways. Yeah. And so, so maybe like, you know, a good application point for this is the next time you find yourself getting a little bit frustrated mm-hmm. in a worship service, um, you might ask yourself, um, is the, am I getting frustrated because I feel like God's not being honored here? Or am I getting frustrated because my needs aren't being met mm-hmm. here? Uh, and, and like, ask that question honestly. And, you know, it's like, okay, is it a little warm in here? Okay, is that a God dishonoring issue? Or is that a, I'm just a little bit uncomfortable right. issue? Um, like, if the band's not perfectly playing the music right, is that a God dishonoring issue? Or is that just a... I'm just being nitpicky right. or, or the song choice or whatnot. Yeah. And mm-hmm. man, there are, uh, if you look back in history uh, at Baptists, 
when when Baptists were really first starting to to get off the ground uh, in England, and uh, I mean they they endured. You mean back in uh, was it Matthew four or Matthew three? <laughs> 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 no, uh, that's a that's a seminary joke because everyone's like all the denominations are like mine goes all the way right, back to the mine Bible. Mine was first. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was an inside joke. Y'all probably don't get. It. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. So uh, I mean, when Baptists as um, as a denomination as we know it today, how's that? <laughs> yeah. uh, back in England, they went through and endured times of uh, pretty intense persecution. And uh, with the Baptist convictions that they had in England, for uh, depending on when it is that you you know want to look at the history, you know they weren't um, they weren't tolerated. It's not like not like it is here where you know we have the first amendment uh, of the US constitution where we have uh, the state doesn't get to dictate uh, one religion for the entire nation right <clears throat> and so everybody sort of gets to do their own thing and everybody's tolerated in england it wasn't the case and so uh, these baptists uh, a lot of the times even would have secret worship meetings out in uh, uh, an obscure field somewhere, uh, sometimes even in somebody's barn. And, I mean, this was their commitment to gather together to truly worship God is, like, those things couldn't have been comfortable, Mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, man, if you meet in a barn, there's been animals in there, Mm -hmm. right? It's not like it smells great, probably. In the summertime, it gets hot there sometimes, Mm -hmm. or it gets really, really cold. They met anyway. Uh, yeah. And and they were they were really focused on on worshiping God and and approaching God on His terms and uh, having the focus on Him and not worrying as much about themselves at least from what we know. Yeah, and it's almost easier when you're not in a you know the quote unquote consumeristic yeah. um, you know culture. It's easier to stay focused on God because like you're not you're not like anywhere you go anywhere mm-hmm. be it the mall a store a restaurant. Everything is literally about you, mm-hmm. and so it's hard whenever you go to church to just shift that mindset. But, but it's, it's almost like whenever the church is like shoved into like persecution and shoved underground, uh, it kind of it, it almost makes it easier to to put all those things aside and just get back to the core focus of why you're there. Right, uh, and and maybe that's why. Uh, the Bible is constantly telling us to rejoice whenever we're being persecuted because it it refocuses you yep. every time. Because if uh, if you're being persecuted and and shoved underground and, and doing whatever, it causes you to constantly evaluate why am I even doing this? Right? Why am I walking miles to go sit in a hot barn and listen to bad singing of a bunch of guys? <laughs> <laughs> um, right. <laughs> If it's because I want to be comfortable and I want to hear good music, I'm going to go somewhere else. Yeah. But if it's because I want to worship God and honor God and come together with His church, then boom, yeah, now it's easy. Uh, and so, so just things to think about. Um, you know, distractions are a very real thing, and we're going to talk yeah. about those things um, and, and how that plays into worship of God. But at the root of it, we got to make sure that we're keeping God at the forefront yes. and not our wants right. at the forefront. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, uh, so that's the first point is uh, bad worship focuses on self rather than God. And the second point is bad worship focuses on experience rather than God. I see it in your face. <laughs> bad worship focuses on experience rather than God. Go ahead. Oh, oh my gosh. Um, yeah, and Pastor Lee points out uh, that this sort of uh, worship that's really uh, wants to have an experience asks the question, how do I feel in worship? Mm -hmm. And if I don't have any feelings afterward, then that was just a fail Mm -hmm. as far as worship Mm -hmm. goes. Oh, my gosh. Um, There was – I remember I was in college, and the the college ministry that that we went to, we had a Thursday night worship uh, at this church. And uh, I mean, it was uh, it was great. I mean, the the music uh, was extremely well done. The preaching was great. But I do I have a memory. There's one time that uh, whoever it was that was delivering the message, you know, he he sort of focused on this experience um, part of worship, and you know, he sort of played on the hey, uh, are are you not really feeling being here today? Uh, or is are you just not really you're not really sure you know why you came or or maybe um, 
you know, those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. He was sort of playing on that. And what he said was, the fact that you're here shows that you're expecting something. You're expecting something to happen, you're almost like you're expecting to get something out of this, which wasn't totally wrong because we do go to worship. Uh, you know, we want to hear the word. We want to hear the word preached and things like that. But if that's the primary focus, then we're sort of in trouble, right? Um, I'm uh, feeling something. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm yeah. feeling uh-huh. something, right? Yeah. Um, and so that that was just that's one uh, example yeah. of, of a time I can think of that uh, you know really uh, you know focused on that experience uh, in worship. And uh, I think to be fair, he he was trying to be encouraging. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, if if you're not feeling it, you know, come anyway. And that's yeah, that's the right response mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, but. Don't come just because you're expecting to have some sort of experience. Yeah, well, it's super easy, and I think uh, I think um, people that grew up in church mm-hmm. um, struggle with this more than people who didn't grow up in church, um, mainly because you know when you grow up in church and you grow up in the student ministry, what do you do? You go to camps, yeah, oh, yeah. and and some camps are better about this than others. Yeah. Um, not, not all. I don't want to paint with a broad br- brush here because um, not all camps are like this. But there's a lot of camps that really dig into the experience mm-hmm. of God. Uh, and what happens whenever you take a kid, isolate him from everything, wear him out through um, like games and running around and stuff like that, um, and get him into like a tired state? Like you're just your emotional experiences are going to be heightened, yeah. right? That's why like all these like reality shows, what they do, they isolate you from everyone and wear you out, um, and and just what happens out of that is just emotional responses, and I, I I don't think they're they're aiming to do that, but that's just like it's just the nature of our bodies, right? Uh, once our bodies become exhausted, we we become more emotionally sensitive, especially and, my three year old. Yeah, right. <laughs> Should have seen her last night. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and so what happens at these camps, um, uh, and, and that's why you know, we're, we're pretty careful about where yeah. we go. Um, that's one thing I love about the St. Louis Project uh, that we go to, that that they, I think they try pretty hard to, to not make the the um, the worship experiences that they do there not one of like, um, like feelings, right. like emotional uh, thing. That I, I think they do a pretty good job at, at keeping it. Mm-hmm. Uh, as straight as it can. But anyways, so you, so you have these students who are tired, and then they get into this like you know really big like emotional service and things like that, and they have this like move of God happen within them, uh, and they give may, they may even give their life to God or, or dedicate themselves to ministry or whatever. And then what happens six years later, ten years later, two weeks later, those emotions start to s- subdue. Mm-hmm. And then what do you tell yourself? You say, oh, I don't feel this anymore, therefore God must not be with me right. anymore. Or I, I don't feel this, so was it even real? Right. Or I don't feel this, so do I even love God right. or, or whatnot? And I've talked to people who have oh, been yeah. like that, uh, who they are just so struggling with their, um, their assurance of their salvation because they felt it here and they don't feel it now. And as we've said before, feelings are good. They're mm-hmm. just not reliable. Yep. And so feelings are not a good foundation to build your salvation right. on. <laughs> right. Um, well, and then it's, you know, there's another question then. It's also like, what am I doing wrong? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. in, in the sort oh, of absolutely. wake and midst of all that, it's, you know, I, man, I, I was just on fire when I was at camp. And two weeks later, that's all worn off. So, uh, man, I must be doing something wrong. I'm going to go and chase sort of the next uh, emotional high. Mm-hmm. And and it doesn't usually come that easy. Yeah. It's not like that uh, in, in regular worship normally, like Sunday in and Sunday out kind of a thing. Yeah, and feelings aren't bad. No. Like, no. feelings for sure aren't bad. Emotional responses aren't bad. If you're having a, an emotional response when you come to Christ, I don't think that's a bad thing. No, it's that, not bad. That's totally fine. Lots of people do, especially like if you're feeling like the weight of your conviction and meeting the grace of forgiveness of that. Like I think emotional responses are like a very like normal thing to mm. that. That's not a bad thing. Please please right. hear me. That's not a bad thing. But that's not the basis right. of your salvation. Right. Yeah, and it's uh it's actually flipped, right? Mm-hmm. So and I think Pastor Lee mentioned this or, or some version of this, but uh basically as we worship, it's okay to have an emotional response, right? 
but we we don't want to be chasing the emotional response first at the expense of mm-hmm. worship. And so the question is, okay, you know, what are the things that really lead us to worship, and what are the things, uh, you know, that uh, well, let me let me kind of put it this way. I I think, uh, and I I believe uh, pretty strongly that uh, when we have good doctrine, solid doctrine, and we really are meditating on on God's word and the the truths of God's word, man, uh, you know, we do experience those emotional uh, feelings uh, even in worship, and uh, you know, it's. It's a fun thing to experience, right? Mm-hmm. But the the root and the basis of that is who God is, what He's done for us, and how great He is, especially in light of who we are. Um, yeah, that that can lead to uh, having emotions or a particular experience. Yeah. But so, so you're saying the emotions can be a good byproduct yeah. of our worship, but it's not the aim right. of the worship. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Gotcha. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, and and really, you know, if we were to like take this back to marriage, mm-hmm. like it's the same thing with marriage. Like, if you're doing everything right, like in the sense of like you're focusing on your spouse and uh, you're you're aiming to serve your spouse, what usually comes out of that is emotions. Yeah. Like, like you love your wife, like you um, you like your wife, you like being around your wife, um, like uh, you know all the butterflies, all yeah. that stuff. All those things can come with marriage, but if you wake up one day and it's not there, does that mean all of a sudden you don't love them anymore? Right. Does that mean all of a sudden you shouldn't be married to them anymore? Right. Does that mean that you shouldn't serve them, that you shouldn't care for them and look out for them? Absolutely not. Certainly not. And maybe the culture thinks that. Maybe that's why divorce rates are over 50%. Yeah. Oh. Um. <laughs> You're right. Well, there was a, a video that I saw this past week, or maybe it was a week before, and uh, there was a guy that uh, he was experiencing sort of a, um, you know, kind of a lull in his prayer life. Uh, he wasn't, you know, he didn't, he wasn't having the experiences that he he uh, was sort of used to having at that point. And so uh, somehow he ran into uh, J.I. Packer. He got in the car with him. For some reason, I guess they were going somewhere. Uh, and, and this guy that was talking on the video, he's, he's a younger guy. And so he asked uh, Packer, he says, hey, do you ever experience this uh, sort of in your prayer life where it just seems kind of dead? And I mean, there's, you know, not having a lot of uh, emotions or feelings and, uh, you know, things like that. And uh, Packer, I mean, he's, uh, you know, written lots of books. He's, uh, he's been a, uh, uh, you know, minister for a long time and, and teacher and things like that. And, you know, as far as, you know, spiritually, you'd figure he'd be up here all the time, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but uh, Packer's response was, yeah, that's my prayer life right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been that way for a while. Mm-hmm. And and so he says, well, what do you do? Or, you know, what are you doing about that? He goes, I'm just going to keep praying. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. uh, that's what we do, right? Yeah. It's sort of like, you know, when we're not having any sort of, uh, you know, feelings that, oh, man, that was just an overwhelming worship service, or that mm-hmm. was just an overwhelming prayer time, or, man, I, I just got so much out of reading uh, Scripture today. Um, we do those things not because of our experiences, but because God is worthy of, mm-hmm. of our worship, and He's worthy of those things yeah. uh, that we can give Him. Yeah. And so, if the feelings are there, great. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. The feelings aren't there, that's okay. Yeah. And you just keep pressing forward, like that's in right. the same way you know, with the marriage. If you wake up and uh, you're all giddy about your wife and want to serve her, great. If you wake up and you're not, you serve, still do it. Serve her anyway. You still serve yep. um, because that's what love is. That's yep. what commitment is. Uh, and so same thing with God. If you if you come in to service and it doesn't matter what the songs are, man, you just feel it within you and it's just outflowing, great. Man, I'm happy for you. If it's not... You still worship. Yep. You still worship. You just don't say, "Oh, I guess God didn't move today," right? Um, I, I kind of hate that that yeah. statement of like, "Man, God really moved today." It's like, what do you even mean by that? Right. It's like, does that mean God didn't move the other days? And does that mean that whatever I'm feeling on the inside is that's the determining factor of if God moved or not? Mm-hmm. And that's super subjective. It's it's really subjective and it's really shallow. Yep. Um, like like what I see is God moving 
uh, is are people taking the truths of God and now applying it to their life, whether mm-hmm. through repentance or um, how can I love God better, follow God better, love my spouse better, love my, my mm-hmm. family better. That's God moving right. in Spiritual our Spiritual growth. Um, if you go home feeling thing. good, again, it's not bad. That's okay. That's okay. But I don't use that as a metric of God moving. Right. 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 Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Any other thoughts on the experience side of things? Um, Special. uh, I I do think that special spiritual experiences are definitely not the norm, uh, not the rule. Um, I mean, think about like Abraham, for Mm -hmm. example. so in Genesis, you know, God appears to him and, you know, very few times. I mean, if you look at the span of Abraham's life, I mean, yeah. now relative mm-hmm. to everybody else, <laughs> that, that it's a lot, but God mm-hmm. appears to him a handful of times. Sometimes, you know, we're talking decades in between, mm-hmm. right? And Abraham, uh, to different extents, is, is faithful through through that. Like, overarchingly, yes, mm-hmm. you know, he stays faithful, uh, but it's not like... This was an everyday occurrence mm-hmm. for Abraham, just as an yeah. example. It's, um, I mean, the mundane day-to-day was just normal living, Yeah, right? Well, and that's a good point, um, not even just in Abraham's life, but uh, across the whole Bible. Yeah. Like, it's easy to look at the Bible and be like, well, why don't I see this right. in my life? Why don't I see these things going on? And keep in mind, the Bible is a compilation of, like, the highlights right. of, like, where God is you know, meeting man. Uh, and so, like, you got Abraham where, yeah, where God uh, may meet Abraham in that moment. They may make a covenant and whatnot. And then the next verse may say, and then 40 years later. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> well, what happened in those 40 years? Right. Um, and you've got, let's let's say there's a thousand experiences, God experiences throughout the Bible. Maybe more, maybe less. I, I don't know. But just for argument's sake, let's say there's a thousand well, there's a thousand spread across, across what, six thousand years, seven thousand years, roughly speaking, from, uh, from creation to to uh, Jesus. Um, so, so say a thousand experiences over six thousand years across billions of people. Yeah. Man, super low percentage yeah, it's on a those experiences. Very low, per- and that of course that doesn't mean that God didn't move outside right. of those accounts. But it's just like a like a reassurance thing of like, man, I don't feel God moving in my life. Well, that's okay. Abraham had decades where he didn't feel, maybe uh, right. feel, quote unquote, feel God moving in his life. But that's not the determining factor of if we follow God and worship God. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's a good point. Yeah. All right. So, uh, those are the first two points on really bad worship. Bad worship focuses on self rather than on God. Bad worship focuses on experience rather than than God. And three, bad worship is, quote, quote, unquote, crazy worship. (laughs) Not my words, Lee's words, and not Lee's words. Paul's words. Paul's words. (laughs) Let's let's read this passage first uh, before we we talk about this. You want to read that? Yep. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 23. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? <laughs> I, I have. Amen. <laughs> I have experienced this. Have you? <laughs> yes. We'll talk about it in just a second. But first, let's just provide a little bit of context yep. on what's going on. Um, so, so this verse right here comes from like really a two or three chapter thought that mm-hmm. Paul's uh, expressing here, and, and Paul's communicating with the the Corinthians about spiritual gifts. And the Corinthian church was a a young, vibrant, talented church, and with young, vibrant, talented churches comes ego yeah. and narcissism, yeah. and everyone wants to outdo one another, um, in not a good way. Um, and so, uh, Paul specifically addressing tongues here, and, and Pastor Lee mentioned this, but um, what was going on is uh, everyone was standing up and speaking in tongues at the same time. And, and tongues, for argument's sake, let's just define tongues as an angelic language that God is speaking through someone to communicate uh, to the church. A um, lot more, yeah, lot, lot, lot more to say about that, but let's just give it that, that simple definition. Um, 
And so what would happen is they would be in a church service and everyone's like, oh, I've got a word from the Lord, da, 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 whatever the tongues is. And then this person's like, I've got a word from the Lord, da, 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 tongues. And now everyone is, is speaking in tongues uh, in, this, in this language that no one can understand unless you're an interpreter. And that's where Paul gets into an order of service, yeah. um, for lack of a better word, where he basically says, Hey, if someone's going to speak in tongues, that's fine. Just one at a time. And if you're going to speak in tongues, you have to have an interpreter that can understand what you're saying and then communicate it to the church. Because if the church can't understand what's going on, then what's the point? Yep. Right? That was basically what Paul was getting at. That's the broader context of what's going on here. But you have this verse. Where he says, so if the whole church comes together and everyone is speaking in tongues, no one's interpreting, no one's understanding of what's going on, some unbelievers come in and they'll say, you guys have lost your mind. Yep. <laughs> what are y'all doing? <laughs> and that's, of course, not what we want, right? No, definitely not. Uh, so my experience with this, I was, um, I was at a church uh, that was a little bit, and by a little bit, I mean a lot of bit, charismatic. I didn't. I didn't realize they were. Uh, they were just looking. I think I've told you the story. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm not going to say the church just for, for namesake. Uh, but uh, I had a friend that went there, and they were looking for people to help play in their their band uh, for their young adult service. So I went and was playing drums uh, with them, and uh, they wanted to do a prayer service uh, beforehand with all the band and all the the volunteers and whatnot. And so we all gathered around. So far, so good. So far, so good. Um, and and we gather around for prayer. Now, keep in mind, I'm Baptist. I've grown up Baptist my whole life. We start praying, and uh, th- there's a little phrase that they said. It's like, um, uh, everyone pray in the Spirit. And I've never heard that phrase before. Boy, did I learn what that meant. <laughs> everyone, there's probably 20, 25 people there. Everyone started speaking in tongues at the same time. And I'm just like, I literally look up and I'm like looking around like, what is going on here? Remember, Baptist. I don't know if I've ever seen anyone speak in tongues at this point. Everyone is speaking in tongues. uh, And then they would speak in tongues for a few minutes and then they would would stop. Whoever was leading it would say a few words. Um, And I remember one time, in in the prayer thing, uh, they they said they said, "Does anyone have a word from the Lord to share?" And this uh, lady raised her hand, and they handed the mic to the lady, and she said, "All right, everyone pray in the spirit," and everyone starts speaking in tongues, and then she starts speaking in tongues, and I'm like, "Wait, I thought you had a word from the Lord for us, but now not only can we not understand you, but now everyone else is also praying, and so like 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 um." Uh, like, like logically, this doesn't make sense because I thought you were sharing a word from the Lord for us, from us. So, so that's the, on that part. That's just an example of what Paul was getting at. Of right. like, like this is not being productive in corporate worship here. Mm-hmm. Um, but even more so. So, so the second week I went back and I decided I don't know if I want to be part of this. Um, so I just hung out outside. And um, while I was hanging out outside, this was about. 15 minutes before the service was about to start, they had some visitors come in and they walked in uh, past us and they were like, hey, is this where the young adult service is? I'm like, yep, it's right through here. She walks in. Uh, one minute later, walks right back out <laughs> and she says, when does the service start? And I was like, oh, I'm probably about 15 minutes. And she said, okay, they are like hardcore praying in there. <laughs> and like, so you could tell she's like a little bit freaked out. Yeah. And I could, I, I knew in her mind, she was thinking, those guys have lost their minds. Yeah. Um, and and the, this is not we're we're, we're not going to dig into the the doctrine of tongues and and all that. Um, Just because we don't have time. We don't have time. The, there's there's lots of things to be said about yeah, that. Yeah. But we're more talking about what Paul's getting at here is the practical effect of what's going on, right, right or wrong. We're talking about the practical effect of what's going on, and Paul's saying that whenever all of y'all come together like this. You're, de- you're defeating the purpose. Everyone is going to think that you've lost your minds. And uh, at, the, at the core purpose of it, no one's communicating anything. Right. No one's getting anything out of this. The church is not being edified and built up by this. Everyone is just seeking their own needs yep, um, right. in this. Uh, it's about the ego. Yeah. And, and so what, what we pull from this is what Paul is saying is, is that whenever you come into corporate worship, it is not a free-for-all. 
Right. That is that is not the goal of corporate worship, and and we see this um, often is like like people people will come into corporate worship and treat it like private worship, mm-hmm. and private worship and corporate worship are two different things. Yes, uh, I have a something to say on that. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I am. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to uh, announce that my own private worship, mm-hmm. which usually consists of me in my truck by myself as I'm driving down the road, belting out the uh, <laughs> lyrics to my favorite uh, hymns and songs and things like that. Are your that. kids in the backseat? Oh, yeah. The kids <laughs> are subject to it, 100%. Uh, and uh, Joni, our three-year-old, she uh, she doesn't like it when I sing. Mm-hmm. So she's, she'll be in the backseat just mean mugging me. And no, you need to stop and whatever. Oh yeah, anyway. Lottie. Whenever, <laughs> whenever me or Randy start singing, mm-hmm. um, Lottie will say, "Stop singing." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like she's like, "I want to listen to the song. I don't want to listen to you." Right. Uh, but uh, I'm very happy to announce because you know I'm I know for a fact I'm not the best singer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm very happy to announce to everyone uh, that that sort of private worship does not flow over into corporate worship. Well, you. Yes. Um, I know. Um, I'm glad that you were looking out for the edification of the church <laughs> right. on that. It's uh, my dad's fault. I'll blame him. Yeah. Uh, growing up uh, in church with my dad, my dad would very proudly sing. Uh, and uh, the problem is he'd just be just flat enough in, in hitting that note that is just, I think it scrambled my brain. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and, but he knows this about himself, mm-hmm. and uh, it's it's fun. Now mm-hmm. we we still we talk about it sometimes, and yeah, thanks for that. Dad, yeah. and anything, everything else. But anyway. yeah, uh, oh, I had a thought. I lost it. Um, oh yeah, uh, so I've talked to people before where they've come in and they're like, like man, I just I don't like this music. I don't like this music, and and it wasn't even like a hymn thing. Yeah. It was a I just don't like the style of music. I like this style of music, and I don't think this music is good. I think this music is good. And it's like the classic debate um, in contemporary Christian worship music yeah. uh, that they you know people will say like oh it's just like the same four chords over and over again, the same song just rehashed over and over again, and you know there may be some truth to that, um, <laughs> but. Uh, so, so in my mind, I compartmentalize it into two things. So there's what I enjoy personally, like in terms of like what style of music do I enjoy, um, uh, you know, types of singers, so on and so forth. And then there's like whenever I come into the church and church music, I set my preferences aside and more move into, okay, what's going to be the best for corporate worship? Mm-hmm. And, and there's lots of things that that um, play into that. That's like um, like the rhythm of the song, the how high the song goes singing wise, how low it goes, um, uh, the the lyrics, um, like like what's the aim of the lyrics? There's some like great Christian songs that are terrible corporate songs, mm-hmm. corporate worship songs. Um, and so you have to like evaluate all those things. And so there's times that you know people like criticize, Christian corporate worship music um, as like too simple. And it's like, of course it needs to be simple. We're coming together corporately and singing these things. We're not coming together for a concert or right. just sitting down and listening. Um, we're coming together to sing these things. So they have to be singable. Right. Right. Like you, it's not just like trained musicians and vocalists that are going to be singing this. It's going to be your average right. guy and your average girl um, who doesn't have great ranges right. and stuff like that. And, and that's also part of the reason that you don't see four new songs being introduced yeah. Sunday morning yeah. because if you, I mean, you know, having one new song is, mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. But uh, what you hate to have is, oh, here are four new songs that we're all going to learn yeah. today. And yeah, uh, good luck trying to keep up. Well, it's, it's, the, tough. it's the classic divide. You, you've got younger people who can pick up on songs like that, mm-hmm. man. Uh, it, it takes them no time at all. And then you have older people who, who don't. Um, it's just, it just takes a little bit longer, especially if it's a new style. Yeah. It takes a little bit longer for them to learn it. And so you've got younger people who are like, why are we constantly singing old songs? I'll sing new songs. And you got older people who are like, why are we constantly singing new songs? We need to sing older songs. I don't know these new songs. And you would be, if you're a musically inclined person, you would be surprised how long it takes for a, a body, like a, a church, to be able to 
fully adopt a new song to the point that they can sing it. Mm-hmm. Um, like th- there are songs that we introduced five years ago that they're just now getting to the point that they can fully internalize it and communicate it. Yep. Um, because like if you're constantly introducing new songs, now there's lots of things that are like going on at once in your mind. You're like, okay, hey, what, what's the rhythm? What's the melody? What's the words? Um, and they're focusing so much on that. They're not even like, you're not even actually worshiping anymore right. because you're trying to keep up with the newness of the mm-hmm. song. Uh, Don't and, start too early before everybody else is singing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so all, all these things, you know, uh, have to take place. I don't remember how we got on the subject. <laughs> um, uh, oh, yeah. Corporate worship versus private worship. Yeah. All these things have to be kept in mind whenever you're coming into a corporate worship. That's that's the important key. Keep in mind that whenever we gather together as a church, we are engaging in corporate worship, not private worship. Private worship, you do what you want to do, right? Like, like, yeah, drive down the <laughs> the the highway and whatever your jam is, as long as it's worshiping God, um, man, belt it out, sing it out, do whatever you want. If it's like like jazz worship, I don't know. <laughs> is that um, a thing? Uh, yeah, country worship, I don't know. Whatever it is, um, <laughs> that's fine. But whenever we gather together corporately, the, the goal isn't what music do I like. The goal is what music is going to gather us all together the best. Yep. And allow us to unify in one voice and sing to God. Yeah. Um, that's the goal in that. Now, in that, uh, in corporate worship, it moves into the, the question of distraction. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and Lee goes through quite a number of these. But uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that... Um, God looks at the heart. Obviously, God looks at the heart. But at the same time, if we look at 1 Corinthians 14 that we just mm-hmm. saw here, that order does come into play yep. with the church. Um, and and at the same time that God looks at the heart and wants people to sing joyfully, at the same time, uh, there's the reality of distraction and that uh, we don't want – Paul doesn't want, God doesn't want, the Bible doesn't want um, – in a corporate worship service for distraction to now take the focus off of God and place it on something else, Mm -hmm. whether that was the intent or not. And a lot of times I don't think that's the intent. Um, I agree. But but there's times that we do things that are distractions that are pulling the focus off of God and we don't even realize that that's happening. Yeah, and it's like in the case of the Corinthians, uh, Pastor Lee also uh, gave us uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 32 and 33, Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, even back to verse 31, he, uh, Paul writes, For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For not, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Mm-hmm. So, and, and mine puts it, God is not a God of disorder. Yeah. Or uh, the NIV uh, puts it that way. Um yeah. Right, yeah. confusion, yeah. chaos, mm-hmm. disorder. Yeah. Right, yeah, and yeah, God is God of order mm-hmm. uh, and of peace instead of those things. Mm-hmm. And so that's what that means is, you know, and, and Pastor Lee talked about this is even if we have a particular spiritual gift or ability that we have, it doesn't mean that we have to like turn the volume all the way up on that particular gift mm-hmm. within a worship service. Right, mm-hmm. uh, it's not like we're completely overtaken by the spirit we're just so overwhelmed that like we start you know maybe in their case you know speaking uh ecstatically mm-hmm. uh, and we fall into a trance and start you know mm-hmm. prophesying or something like that. that's not what this says mm-hmm. um it says the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets that means mm-hmm. you know we we retain control of our motor functions we, mm-hmm. we we retain control of ourselves it's not that you know uh, and that's even a fruit of the spirit is self-control mm-hmm. and so uh, you know, along those lines, whenever we are you know, worshiping, whether it's through uh, the song or through uh, reading God's word or through the sermon, uh, the invitation time, uh, all those things, you know, we're, we need to retain our self-control to not be a distraction yeah. uh, to those around us and those sorts of things. Yeah, and I love that that Paul stated this. If he didn't experience this um, back then, he had the the knowledge of God too. <laughs> 
to know that was going to happen because a lot of times what we hear is don't stifle the spirit right or like the spirit is moving within me and who are you to tell the spirit to stop moving and paul's like hey the spirit of the prophet is in control of the prophet or sorry the prophet the Other prophet yeah there. the prophet is in control of the spirit of the prophet but, yeah. So, yeah anyways all that say is like the spirit is moving within you that's great but you're in control mm-hmm. of that. Um, and so it's like there's never going to be a time that you can dump the the responsibility off on the Spirit and say like, oh, I can get up and do whatever I want, no matter whether it is a, a distraction when I'm called on, called out on it. I just say, are you stifling the Spirit? Right. I just, have you read this verse where it says like, like no, you are in control of yourself. And uh, I'm... I'm Super happy that that was put in the Bible um, because that is a a big point in contention whenever we're talking about spiritual gifts and stuff like that, that people just very much lean into the spirit is this like uncontrollable um, force force (laughs) that that you can't plan Mm -hmm. and that you can't stop Uh, salvifically. Sure, <laughs> um, but when it comes Thank to the spiritual, God. yeah, <laughs> but when it comes to uh, spiritual gifts, like that's just couldn't be further from the case. Um, and at the end of the day, as you were getting at, the whole point of the spiritual gifts wasn't that you can turn the dial up to eleven and uh, hinder worship. The whole point of spiritual gifts is that how can you fit this gift into the body of the church so that it helps build the church. Right. And and that's the key, yep. is the body of the church. Yep. Again, we're right back to corporate worship versus mm-hmm. individual yep. worship. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, so, so those are, are just things to keep in mind. Um, now, Lee points out a few different uh, uh, <laughs> ways that uh, corporate worship can distract. And and usually here, so I'm on the stage a lot. You're on the stage a lot, um, uh, playing music and and things like that. And I, I find there's a balance mm-hmm. here um, because obviously we want the music to be good, oh, right? Yeah. Um, but it's all about the motive behind it. So I think there's times that music can be so good that it can be distracting. And then there's times that music obviously can be so bad yeah. that it's distracting. And so usually what I'm looking for is like, again, in a corporate worship mindset, we want the music to be excellent because God is worthy of excellence, mm-hmm. but we don't want the, the music to be so flashy that now it's distracting from the worship of God. Because right. again, we're coming from the, the mindset of corporate worship. Right. Um, and so, so usually it's this balance of we want it to be solid enough um, that it's enhancing the corporate worship, and if wrong notes are in there, now that's a distraction. Right, or uh, even I think under the the first point, Pastor Lee, uh, he mentioned you know preferences and are we worried about ourselves? And one of the things he said was, "Are the drums too loud?" Mm-hmm. And um, I mean that that does flow right in with what we're talking about for me, especially mm-hmm. playing playing drums. Is like if I'm too loud and drowning out a lot of other uh, instruments and what people need to hear and God forbid the voices because that's, you know, the words and uh, what it is that we're singing. Man, uh, I have now gotten in the way Mm -hmm. of of people corporately worshiping. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Yeah. That's a serious problem. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, so, man, uh, yeah, even on stage, there's a lot of things to think about or, hey, let's try not to mess up this drum fill right here and cause a distraction and now everybody's focused on me instead of, focused on right. God, that's, yeah, it's something to, to yeah, be aware of and think about all the time. Yeah, you can mess it up. You know, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we were in a, a time, uh, you know, playing a bluegrass song and do the key change. And if the key change went right, now it like enhances the worship yeah. and everyone's like, yeah, we're feeling, uh, you know, the, this, uh, you know, uh, we're, like, we're on a journey together and we're moving forward and singing these songs. And it went from that to, it sounds like a bunch of noise and we just had to stop. And you want to call that a distraction? I would say that's a distraction, yep. right? And at the same time, you know, if I'm playing guitar and I just decide to shred the solo, <laughs> that can also be a distraction, right? Right? It could be so good that people are like, whoa, which usually is what people say when they hear me play. They're like, whoa, that's so good. Right. I'm just kidding. What was that? I, I showed you a video. <laughs> what was it? They were playing some like Starfield song, I think, is a worship song. Uh, what, what is it? With the drummer? No, uh, with the guitar player. And uh, what, however it is that the, the chords lined up. And 
it's the sort of interlude, so the guitar player starts playing the uh, Star Wars theme song. Oh, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've seen that. Uh, I've seen people do it with, like, the Office theme song. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They're, like, playing it. Uh, I've seen, I've actually, I, I was at a camp, um, and they were playing every move. I'm, no, no, it wasn't every move, mate. Right? It was a... Um, Chances are it was, just saying. But. Right, uh, it was a uh, Rain Down. It's an old, old song. <laughs> yeah. um, and the guitar player throws in the... Um, Carry on my wayward son, like bam, 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 and um, and it was one of those things. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Uh, like guitar player, I'm like, yeah. I love that song, and they were throwing it in there, and I thought it was the coolest thing. But in its coolness, it actually distracted me right. from what we were actually right. doing. I th- instead of thinking, man, how can I hone in on the words of the song and, and worship God? My focus went to that guy just played Carry on my wayward son. Right. <laughs> And yeah, it, uh, I think I mean, it's I think it's hilarious mm-hmm. on YouTube and Facebook uh-huh. Reels. Was it funny in church and yeah, in church in a real life no, situation? Definitely yeah, not. probably not the best look. No. Uh, probably not the best thing to do. No. Um, so there's always that balance of like, how can we give our all to God in um, in what we do and in the excellence of what we do, yet balance that line to where we're not getting to a point of distraction, right? Right, um, and that gets into to some of these um, some of these examples, yeah. real life examples uh, that uh, we may be all experienced all these or, or some of these, but here's some real life examples. PDA. Oh man, we're skipping around. Okay. Oh, uh, oh, was there one before that? Uh, yeah, I thought so. Well, I I took notes in the first. Oh yeah, service, I, th- I think so maybe, yeah, I maybe think it's a little bit different, mixed up a little bit. Okay, um, go ahead. Okay, we'll, start uh, with we'll, we'll go through these, and if I miss yeah. one, then you can do it. PDA, public displays of affection. <laughs> And you turn to the students with this because it's always the students. Well, yeah, well, right. it's funny. Uh, I won't call them out, but right in front of me, there's uh, – well, I guess they're not students anymore. Uh, mm. They're married. So he had his arm around her. And it's funny because I was holding my wife's hand in the service. Mm. And then as soon as he said PDA, then, you know, she lets go. He moves <laughs> his arm. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm not sure if that's what he meant by PDA. But he was talking about people kissing mm-hmm. at church mm-hmm. in the worship service. Like, and it's usually students. Yeah, yeah. Usually students. Uh, actually, I've gone up to students and I say, "Hey, um, there, there's ones that like you know they're seriously dating. Yeah. Um, you know they love each other. They're they're getting older. They want to be considered adults. And I've actually gone to them. And I say, "Hey, look at all these other married couples. Do you see any of them acting that way? In fact, like, like whenever you act that way, it actually communicates that you shouldn't be taken seriously." Mm-hmm. Um, anyways, it's a whole different thing. It is very distracting, yeah. especially if you're sitting behind that oh, yeah. and you're just seeing that. So, students, if you're watching, I usually don't see adults doing this. Um, Not but, usually, no. Yeah, and of course, there's like you know, there's a difference between PDA and just like yeah, like, like if you got your arm around yeah. them, like that's not PDA. No. Well, when we're talking about PDA, we're talking about like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the hormones going everywhere. Anyways, um, you should take that little clip right there and make it part of the intro. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, baby screaming. That was good. that was my number one. That was your number was one. I number think he started with that one in the. Yeah. <laughs> may, maybe he took out the PDA in the first service because all the students are in the second service. Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> or so he could, just like you know, copy paste that one to the top for yeah. them. And yeah, you typically don't see senior adults struggling with PDA. Uh, not usually. And uh, if so, let us know what will. We'll run them through church discipline. Um, <laughs> baby screaming. Yep. In clarification, you have kids, young kids. I have young kids. What he's not talking about is like the the normal, you know, like cooing and yeah. and uh, you know being slightly fussy. Yeah, maybe, slussy, you know. fussy for a little bit. It's whenever it moves into a slight because because you know yeah. you, you know when a baby like starts to fuss a little bit and you can calm them down and you know when it turns into oh no no this is a full blown. You're right. Situation right. that we got to deal with, right? Depending on um, how old they are, it's, yeah. It, it, is this a fit? Well, then, yeah, yeah. we're going outside. Yeah, uh, got to get this under control. Yes. Or if they're itty bitty and they don't throw fits yet, then, yeah, you know, yeah, and it's a full on like I'm really hungry or tired or need a diaper change or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like it's okay to to take them out. Yeah. Uh, well, and 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 I do this not just in church, but um, but anywhere. Like yeah. we're at the gro- you know we were at the grocery store yesterday. And Lottie was just having a hard time. And what I could do is let her keep having a hard time and just keep walking. But usually what I do is I'll stop and I'll pull her to the side. And, like, we're not moving yep. from this spot 
until we get it under control yep. and, and have an understanding moving forward. Um, because that's, that's, uh, inconsiderate to the rest of the people right. around me. Right, right. That, and it's a disservice to, to yeah. our kids. Yeah, um, and you've actually said um, that you uh, you take your kids completely out. Oh, I'll take them out. So, yeah. <clears throat> uh, especially if uh, if uh, Sam is with us when we go shopping. Um, yeah, I'll take the littlest one who's lost her mind or whatever, and they can they keep shopping. Mm-hmm. I'm like, we're gonna go sit outside and until you calm down, and then when we calm down, we can go back. Or if it just keeps getting worse, like, fine, we're going back to the truck, and we're going to sit here, and we're going to wait for mm-hmm. everybody else to be done shopping because, you know, and then worst case, I'm by myself, littlest one's throwing a fit. It's like, well, leave the basket, forget it. We're going home. <laughs> uh, it's not worth it. We'll, yeah. Uh, yeah, we got to get get ahead of the fit throwing yeah. uh, while we can. So it's that same kind of mindset of um, if you as a parent see, okay, this is moving from a normal level yeah. of, like, okay, I can deal with this right now, to, okay, this is going to be something that's going to take a little bit more dealing. It's okay. Just step out. Yeah. Let's step out. Um, we've had to take a lot of y'all surfaces before yeah. and deal with it in the lobby. Um, you know, it happens. Uh, no judgment. Yeah. Um, it happens. Happens to everybody. Yeah. And luckily, here at our church, we, we both have a cry room. We mm-hmm. have a cry room that we pr- uh, put the service through for that reason. And we have a lobby that we um, the service gets piped out into the lobby that you can just sit there and if you want to keep listening and, and partake and and again with Lottie or, or Judson, um, you know, once we get back under control, okay, now we can come back in. Yep. Um, and the whole point of that isn't isn't like a um, oh we're punishing me for that. It's it's more of I, I'm trying to look out for the betterment of again the right. the corporate worship because if my kid is yelling uh, back here, that's going to be a distraction from the corporate worship, right. and we don't want that. Right, exactly. Right. Our, um, other ways that we can uh, distract is, um, I have it written down, I don't remember how you said it, singing at the top of our lungs. Yep. Um, and that's like... And then the flip is also true. Yeah, the so, mumbling. Singing too loud or not singing loud yeah. enough, right? And this is one of those things, um, everyone has different levels of volume. Whether I'm, I'm actually like a, a more quiet singer, um, but you know, running sound... Uh, over the years, I've experienced the, the spectrum. Mm-hmm. I've experienced like people with a mic, and no matter how much you turn that mic up, you can't hear them. And then I've experienced people with no matter how much I turn down the mic, you can hear them. Yep. Uh, there was one that I ran uh, sound for, and there was a guy singing on the stage, and um, and it wasn't the most in tune um, pitch I've ever heard. Yep. And so. Uh, I, as I was turning him down, I'm like, I keep hearing him, like, like, and and I muted the channel, and I could still hear him. He was singing so loud that without a mic, he was coming over the sound system. That's too loud. Yeah, that's too loud. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little much. Because again, we're we're uh, I'm, at this point, I'm not judging the heart at all. He could have right. a super heart of worship um, in that. But now we're moving into again distraction territory. Right. It's, it's that we just, have to think about. Right. It's being aware of other people. Yeah. So uh, this has happened uh, to me uh, more than a few times. So we'll be uh, in worship uh, when I'm not on stage, or maybe even a Wednesday. And man, this song is just kicking. It's great. So here I am. I'm singing, and I'm starting to edge over into like, you know, the bottom levels of where I sing in my truck by myself for my private <laughs> worship. And the people in front of me will sort of like, you know, when they do that sort of like look behind, sort of like this, they eyeball you just mm-hmm. a little bit, mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm being a little too loud. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I'm probably distracting these people that are directly in front of me, mm-hmm. uh, because it's kind of like whenever you know you're driving and somebody is like in the fast lane and you're like Texas road blocked, mm-hmm. and then they're just driving poorly mm-hmm. and won't move mm-hmm. over, and then finally they like edge the car that's in the right lane and they finally get over and like you go to pass them and you have to like look at them <laughs> to find out like well, what are you doing? It's you know it's yeah. it's sort of like that. So I just. You know, being aware. Yeah, and I think the on on the road is like a good analogy for this. Is um, it's like you want you want to go. What, what do they call it? Like you keep you keep the pace of the speed yeah. of everyone around you. Um, and so let's say if I was going to a church that that didn't sing out, um, and I wanted to help build the culture of singing out. Well, I'm not going to sing at a twenty, right? Um, because now, like now, I, I'm not encouraging people to sing out anymore. 
in fact, everyone's just looking at me. It's like, yeah. why are you singing out like that? Right. And so what I'm going to do is like, if everyone's singing at a level four, I might sing at like a seven. To kind of, I'm just going to go just enough higher to them to help encourage them to come up. But if, if they're at a four and I go to a 14, mm-hmm. now they're, that, that, that's so far away that it's not going to encourage anyone else to sing out. Mm-hmm. Um at all, and again, it, it moves into a distraction uh, territory, and so it's this weird balance. Again, corporate worship. Right. We're talking about corporate worship, not private worship. In corporate worship, there's this balance of we want to collectively come together and sing out, yet not sing out so much that again we become a distraction mm-hmm. to those around us. I was at a um, a conference one time, uh, and there's probably four thousand people there. Um, and, uh, there was this, um, younger, uh, girl who was sitting behind me and, um, man, she was singing it out (laughs) to the Lord. And I, and again, like heart wise, I think her heart was probably in the right place, but it was so loud and she was literally right behind me. It was so loud. I could not focus on anything. Right. And um and uh, did you do the look behind thing? I, d- I whenever we sat down, like I, yeah. <laughs> I kind of like look because it was just it was uh, like it wasn't just a little bit loud; it was like uncomfortably loud. Right. Um, and man, if she had a heart for God, man, more power to her in that sense. But again, like the corporate side of things, like we just want to not distract. Um, and it's just so easy. I've had people call me out before. Oh, really? I, I was at a student camp, and uh, there was a student who had no filter at all. And I was singing, and afterwards he turned around, and I can't remember what he said, but something along the lines of like, can you not sing that loud? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and, I was like okay. and my pride was like hurt so bad. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, after my pride was hurt, I, like I, I sat and I thought about it, and I'm like, Okay, maybe I was singing too loud and I was actually distracting them. Yep. Um, and so those are things that we got to think about. Because so in private worship, none of that stuff matters because it's only you. It's you and God, and God, like uh, like we talked about a few weeks ago, can listen through the lens of love. <laughs> yes, um, and, thankfully, <laughs> and, and has the you know joyful heart, all that. But when we come together corporately, it's not just about us and God anymore, or so it's not just about you and God anymore, it's about us and God. Right. 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 And it's, uh, in our worship, yeah, we need to love God. We need to also love our neighbor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who also is trying to worship and mm-hmm. not hinder them. And on the flip side, uh, don't mumble. <laughs> no, don't mumble sing. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Because we are, like, the, the people who do sing louder... What they do have right is we are supposed to sing out. Yeah. Um, there's a song that Watermark put out uh, that I really like based on a psalm, and it, uh, it's called uh, sing, a, um, sing as Loud as He is Worthy. Uh, and I thought that's such a neat line. I wish we did it on Sunday. Um, uh, so whenever he... Coming soon. Yeah, right. Uh, but sing as loud as He is worthy. And I think God is worthy of our song, and He's worthy of us declaring that. Um, not Not just mumbling it, but declaring it. Um, and so, so the people who do sing louder, which at times I'm one of those, um, like, I think we got that part right. Mm -hmm. Like we are supposed to declare these things to God, but keep it in the mindset of not distracting. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And don't mumble. Um, openly talking. Yes. Have you experienced this one? Yes, I have. <laughs> are, are you the one that's talking at the time? Uh, I try not to. Yeah. I try really hard uh, not to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I like what Pastor Lee said. He's like, I don't care and don't want to hear about your fantasy football mm-hmm. team. <laughs> were you? He mentioned. Uh, were you here whenever we pass off to replay? Yeah. So he mentioned it used to be like people view the passing the off to replay as an intermission. That's 100% correct. Because mm. uh, during the off tour, um, most of the time we'd have a special music. Yep. And so I would be up there, like playing a song. And I'm just hearing all of these conversations taking place while I'm trying to play this song or sing this song. And I'm like, guys, guys, <laughs> stop. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's a very real one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, on your phones. Um, man, I'm guilty of this one sometimes. <laughs> Taking uh, phone calls even during uh, the service? I've, or, I've oh, never, are you talking about I've never taken Facebook? a phone call. Yeah, just because uh, like, I might be using my Bible app. Yeah. And it's and that, this is where like uh, I've got nothing against Bible apps. Um, but this is where physical Bibles do beat 
Um, yeah. Digital Bibles is with a physical Bible, there's no temptation to you know, swipe over to a different app right. um, or a notification pops up and you click on it. If you're going to hyperlink mm-hmm. anything, it's to another text. Right, so. yeah. <laughs> uh, and so this is where where physical Bibles do, do win. Mm-hmm. Answering phone calls. Uh, I have answered a phone call, not in the service, like I walked out, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah. There's a, on the answering phone calls, every now and then what will happen is uh, someone's phone will start ringing and the person whose phone it is doesn't hear it or realize it's their phone. And yeah, so it just, it just rings, and rings and rings and rings. And everyone is like, whose phone is this? Right. The kicker, though, uh, you know, and I think once, you know, okay, all right, that was a distraction. We can forgive that. What's harder to forgive is when it's like three times in the same mm-hmm. service and it's like the same ringtone. Mm-hmm. It's like, put it on silent. Turn it off. Like, even better, just turn it mm-hmm. off. Because, so, I mean, it, it's like, you know, so even sometimes I'll get, I'll get phone calls Sunday morning and it's like, everybody who, you'd figure everybody who knows me knows, like, this is like <laughs> when we're at worship. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to answer the phone because today's the Lord's Day. It's Sunday morning. We're here for corporate worship, and I'm not going to miss this mm-hmm. to go and stand and talk on the phone for, you know, a couple of minutes, you know. And, yeah. Um, so it's, I mean, if I, I, I do think if we have a higher view of, of our corporate worship on the day that we gather together, we're going to be less likely to like even want to take those calls anyway. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, my phone, 95% of the time is on silent mode anyways. Yeah. Uh, ever since I've gotten an Apple Watch, all the notifications come here. It actually get, it got to the point that like it annoys me when I hear phones go off. Yep. Um, you remember back in the day where <laughs> everyone would put their ringtone to like their favorite song? Yep. And it's just this blaring music, oh, yeah. and it's like no one wants to hear. Like you think it's cool, right. no one wants to hear your ringtone. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, every once in a while, I'll change my ringtone just mm-hmm. for just for fun. Uh, and uh, I mean, the new ringtone is a song that I like, mm-hmm. and so we'll, we'll, I have the family in the car. We'll be driving, and my ring, my phone will start ringing with the ringtone over the speakers, and it's like. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I love this song and like all the kids in the back and uh, especially my wife answer the phone. Like, yeah. I'm like, we're jamming out right well, now. They'll call back if we miss it. <laughs> I would do that in college. Um, you know, when the you know putting your song as a ringtone was like the really popular thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I was listening to a band called Thrice. Uh, have you ever heard of them? Uh, they're like a heavy rock band, like no, like, like so. just shy of screamo. Um, mm-hmm. And one of the songs uh, that I really liked was like, it's like, man, it like came out the gate, like firing, like at 10. And I'm like, man, I love this song. I want everyone else to love this song too. <laughs> and so I said, as my ringtone. And whenever my phone would go off, I would just, I would do that. I would delay a little bit yep. on picking it up because I'm like, everyone else is enjoying this as much as I am. When in reality, everyone's like, shut that phone up. <laughs> right. I, I don't want to hear your phone anymore. That's so great. <laughs> so everyone get an Apple Watch. And then all the notifications come to your wrist. You don't even have to have a ringtone at all. We can we collectively can eliminate phone sounds from our uh, from our life from our life. Also, <laughs> there's a wasp flying around here. I don't know if you saw it. Not that good in here. Okay. Hopefully it doesn't kill us. And going to the bathroom. That was the last one. Yep. At least uh, that I've written down. Uh, this is probably more aimed at students, uh, to, you know, you get into a situation that you're just bored. So what do you do? You just get up and go to the bathroom. Uh, yeah, yeah, don't do that. All these are distractions. And again, the whole point of coming together as the church is to corporately worship. Again, I, I don't know if I can stress that enough. That's why, um, uh, that's why we do the lights the way that we yeah. do. Um, so, uh, so you go to some places where they completely black out the room. Um, to where you can't even see the people around you. And, you know, the whole mindset is, like, you just want it to be you and God. And it's like, that's not corporate worship. Right. The corporate worship isn't you and God. Corporate worship is us and God. And so we lower, but we do understand distractions are a real thing. We've mm-hmm. been talking about distractions for a long time. So we do lower the lights a little bit so that um, it can eliminate some of those distractions. But uh, we keep them up just enough that you can still see around you, and you can still see that you're engaging with the body of Christ corporately. Uh, same thing with volume. We can crank that volume loud enough to where you can't even hear yourself sing. But one of the points of corporate worship is that we are singing together. Mm-hmm. And so um, hearing – one of the things I love um, uh, whenever I'm not on stage uh, – 
uh, is hearing the congregation sing. Yep. Like, that's just a cool thing. I, I don't get to hear it a lot because I'm usually on stage with uh, my in-ears in. Uh, but it's cool being able to hear uh, the body of Christ come together and singing those things. Like, there's something about that, and, yeah. and that's, the, that's the point. Oh, I love it. Um, especially when we do those acoustic sets, yes. and yeah. usually by the by the very end of the last song, uh, I'm out. I'm not playing anymore, mm-hmm. and so uh, usually it's like a last course or something. I'll take mine take out, out and just yeah. enjoy hearing yeah. uh, the body of Christ sing. It's yeah. it's uh, it's really great. I yeah. love doing that. And again, all these things like on the on these distraction side of things, none of that is um, questioning your motive, right? None of that is questioning your heart. Um, again, you can have the most genuine, authentic heart um, in trying to trying to serve God and worship God and those things. Uh, but as we saw uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, there is an order to mm-hmm. it um, because we're coming together collectively right. as the body of Christ. All right. We can hammer that into the ground for another oh, yes. hour. Um, but let's just recap. So, really bad worship, which by the way, this is going to be a multi-week series. Yes. Uh, so, we get to talk a little bit more about this next week. It's exciting. Um, but... Uh, really bad worship. What constitutes bad worship? What constitutes good worship? Uh, this week we talk about bad worship, and Pastor Lee gives us three points. One, bad worship focuses on self rather than on God. Two, bad worship focuses on the experience rather than on God. And three, bad worship is crazy worship, and we don't want to distract uh, from others, and we don't want to, um, uh, at best, distract from others, and at worst, um, turn people away from the gospel Mm -hmm. uh, with what we do. Um, All right. Cool. All right. We're now going to move into Bad Doctrine of the Week, which has something to do with tambourines. So, share with us, Jacob, this uh, Bad Doctrine of the Week. (laughs) Okay. So, this is actually an article from July 5th, 2012. So, it's it's been some years, um, but it's right in line with... (laughs) with, uh, Ex- everything that Pastor Lee talked about, sort of. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually out of line, kind of. We'll talk about it. Mm-hmm. All right, so here's the, the headline. What would Jesus do? Woman tased and pepper sprayed at church for beating tambourine too loudly. <laughs> okay. Uh, Quite a sensational headline. I like it. Absolutely. I like how it starts. What would Jesus do? What would do? Jesus do? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to that in a second. So, um, back in 2012, it says, Recently, a woman was tased and pepper sprayed during a church service in Oklahoma after disruptively playing a tambourine. Um, this uh, particular woman refused to stop shaking her noisy instrument of praise, and she was escorted outside. Uh, but then she became boisterous, and an altercation followed. And so, uh, the... The, uh, there's a spokesperson for the sheriff's department said nobody could pay attention to the sermon or what was going on. So that's when our deputy was able to take care of the situation. Um, I think it was the, was it the pastor? Uh, no, this is the sheriff's department spokesperson said, uh, he laughed about it and said, she was not filled with the Holy Spirit. She was not being very Christianly. And this is why the folks decided to get her out as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, the question that the article asks, is this the way the church should handle things? Yes. So, so before we get into that, um, we're Baptists, so we don't experience this whole lot. Apparently, in some denominations, the tambourine thing is a very okay. real thing. Hit the brakes on that. Uh-huh. So, after we got done with the music in the second service, I went upstairs uh, to go count kids and guess guess what I saw the kids Did doing. Did they have tambourines? Yeah, they have tambourines. <laughs> oh, I thought it was great. Yeah. Um, and... You know that's uh, that's different than, mm-hmm. <laughs> than what we're talking about. Yeah, so here, apparently, but. apparently it's like a really big deal in um, like kind of like more Pentecostal charismatic yeah. churches. Uh, so I'm on a couple of worship leader uh, groups, and uh, every now and then someone will post, "We had someone bring a tambourine today," uh, and I'm like, I've, "What is this? I've never experienced someone bringing a tambourine." But in some denominations, people will just bring their own tambourine and just. I don't know what it is about the tambourine, but it's always the tambourine. Yep. Um, there was one I ran sound for a conference one time, and a guy brought a shofar, and he was just playing the shofar off in the corner. Like I was, I was running sound, and you know, when you run sound, like you're constantly like listening and analyzing. And I heard this like, mm. 
And it's like right in the middle of the conference, music's going. And I thought, immediately my first thought was, oh, there's feedback going on. And so I'm like trying to like, I'm looking, I'm analyzing, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where is this feedback going on? And I just could not find it. And then I look over to my right, and there's this guy in the corner just blasting away on a shofar. <laughs> I'm sure there's some sort of theological significance to that. I don't know um, uh, much about that denomination. But tambourines. Yeah. Some denominations, people just bring their own instruments. So this lady uh, was just banging away on the tambourine. Not mm. Sounds like it wasn't in a productive way. Um, yeah, definitely not. Uh, but in a in a disruptive way. Um, it's, uh, so we say you couldn't listen to the sermon? So like she was playing it during the sermon? Apparently, yeah. Why? I don't know. Maybe she was kind of trying to you know visualize like some of those churches that have like the organ playing in the background <laughs> of the sermon like and let me hear amen hallelujah Burr! yeah exactly <laughs> or something like that i don't know um I w- it's too bad there's not a video um that might help us a little bit you know yes. as far as figure out exactly what was going on here yes so this lady was being rather disruptive yes. it sounds like they asked her to stop yep and she did not oblige right and so they escorted her to the lobby Things escalated yes. even further to the point that they tased and pepper sprayed her. Pepper sprayed and tased her. <laughs> and tased. Yes. She got both. That's too. intense. Well, yeah. it sounds like she was being a little intense. Yeah. And um, let's see. There's authorities found prescription pain medication in her possession, which may have contributed to her erratic behavior. Okay. So, so she may have been, may have been uh, a little, a little bit under the influence. Yeah. Yes. Um, doesn't, doesn't surprise me. Uh <laughs> Okay, let's get back to the the question that the right the the article posed. What would Jesus do? WWJD. I don't know, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, uh, further down in the article, the uh, the daughter of the woman who was pepper sprayed and tased for being unruly with her tambourine playing skills, um, she she kind of came and uh, you know she's defending her mother is what she's doing and. Uh, what, I'm trying to remember what the quote was. Um, well, she basically says that, hey, uh, Jesus would welcome uh, you know everybody, mm-hmm. and it's hard to imagine Jesus getting upset at somebody trying to worship mm-hmm. in their own way. And you know, th- that was the general feel. That's not a direct quote, but that's the general feel mm-hmm. uh, that you get. So, can you think of a time? Uh, that Jesus was maybe a little bit less than peaceful with worship going on? Um, the one that comes to my mind is him flipping some tables. Yeah. And, and pulling out a whip. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he makes a whip and drives the money changers out of the temple. And so, you know, I mean, we could debate, you know, should they have pepper sprayed and tased her? We don't know. Mm-hmm. We don't know what, what that situation is. Well, at that point, like. so, and, so what's really important to... To note here, it wasn't the church right. that pepper t- pepper sprayed right. and tasered. It, was it wasn't the pastor that right. that zzz, <laughs> did that. That turned into a law enforcement issue. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and so, so whatever happened there actually wasn't the church's call to right. do that. Um, so, right or wrong, that's actually even outside of what right. the church was doing. Um, so, uh, whatever she did escalated to the point that they thought that that was necessary yes. from a law enforcement perspective, right. not a church perspective. But you're right. Um, there are times that Jesus isn't this like, oh, love, peace, joy. Right. Like, he's not um, a hippie. Yeah, he's not a hippie. Uh, and even if he was, so, so let's say that Jesus never did that. Whenever things are brought to here, here's where some bad doctrine comes in. Yeah. Whenever someone says, um, I don't care what the Bible says, did we see Jesus do this? They are demonstrating that they don't have um, a, an authoritative view of the Bible, right? Right, because um, there's some people that do say the words in red have a higher stance than than the words in black, and and that's fine if you want to believe that, but you don't believe that the Word of God is inspired, right? Um, right. Because if you believe that the Word of God is inspired, then you believe that just as much as Jesus said those words, that Paul or that God was speaking through Paul when Paul said those words. Mm-hmm. And so that means that if you're going to hold an authoritative view of Scripture, then you're not going to look at just what Jesus did, which I think it's fine to look at right. what Jesus did and see, like, okay, how does how does the personification of all these things demonstrate? Uh, I think that's fine, but you also have to balance that with everywhere else in the Bible that God spoke. Right. 
Um, right. And so, even if we didn't have an example of Jesus uh, being a little bit more harsh with people, you still have all this other scripture that you got to deal with. Yep. Um, How about let's yeah, let's go with Korah's rebellion in uh, Numbers sixteen. I'm not familiar with that one. Oh. Sure, sure. <clears throat> okay, so this is where shock and surprise time. Uh, some of the Israelites aren't really happy with Moses and their time in the wilderness. And so there's a guy named Korah who leads this rebellion uh, against Moses. They're, they're part of the, the tribe of Levites. Uh, so Korah and like 250 followers, they're like, hey, uh, all of us are, are holy, right? Uh, we're, we're, they're sort of, um, you know, all of their actions are sort of predicated on this idea that, hey, like we're all equal, we're all holy. Um, so Moses, what makes you better than the rest of us? Like, how, who made you, uh, who died and made you prince over us, basically, mm-hmm. is what they're saying. And so uh, Moses responds by uh, falling on his face and uh, he's, uh, he's, you know, talks to God about it. Uh, he, he even tells them, hey, I, I have an idea. How about tomorrow we'll all meet at the tent of meeting and we'll see whose worship is acceptable, right? And so this is where uh, Korah and uh, the, the leaders, really, of the rebellion are there. And they all meet at, uh, in front of the tent of meeting. And God tells everybody else, hey, uh, y'all step back because you don't want any part of what's about to happen. <laughs> so the ground opens up and swallows up uh, oh, okay. Korah and, uh-huh. and his family. And then, yeah. uh, and then all of these uh, Levites who evidently want to be priests who are offering incense and things, um, right? they all get consumed as well. Right? Mm-hmm. Same, it's, it's a very similar thing happens. Hey, y'all back up, and then they get burned up, mm-hmm. uh, if I remember right. Um, <clears throat> and so really the, the big thing is they're – offering unacceptable worship that's not been prescribed, right? They're worshiping mm-hmm. in a way that God mm-hmm. hasn't prescribed for himself to be worshiped. Which so is, if, yeah, which is really important to know in the world of as long as I have my heart right, then everything's fine. But we see in the Bible, God does set boundaries mm-hmm. on how he is to be worshiped. And some some uh, make the case that even a uh, uh, at Mount Sinai when they made the golden calf, mm-hmm. the Israelites did, that they weren't actually worshiping other gods, but they were making the, the calf as a representation of God. Right. Um, but that's not how God right. said, he said, don't have idols. Right. Even if those idols are a representation of me, don't have the idols. Yep. Um, uh, Bethel and Dan, whenever um, uh, they make the, the golden calves in uh, the tribe of uh, Israel, mm-hmm. um, uh, they were making them as a worship place of worship for God, but again, that's, it goes completely against how God said to worship yep. Him. It's uh, just the whole second commandment thing. Yeah, right. Whatever. Yeah, and so uh, worship is all about the heart, but God does put boundaries yep. on how He is to be worshipped, yep. and He takes yep. it seriously. Yeah, right. Yep. Just see uh, once again, uh, if you know, Korah's rebellion. There's tons of examples. Uh, Jesus overturning the the tables of the money changers in the mm-hmm. temple. You know, zeal for uh, for God's house, you know, consumes him. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, there, there's a theme, and it's all the way throughout Scripture. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. And so, uh, what would Jesus do? Uh, would he have tased her? I don't know. Jesus is not in law enforcement. And right. so, uh, but would Jesus have addressed the issue? Probably. Yep. Uh, if it's getting to the point that it's distracting uh, and not um, not building up the church, but rather hindering the church, Oh, yeah, he probably would have said something, uh, yep. as we've talked about for the past hour, about how the Bible digs into um, whenever we gather together, it's not just about you, it's about others yep. and the, the furtherment of God's worship and the gospel and all that. And so, if you want to bring a tambourine, um, you can audition in the band. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put Roxanne on notice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you bring your tambourine and, and play it, and we'll see how it goes. And if it doesn't work well, then then we'll let you know. <laughs> All right, fun. Well, it's been a great uh, great time uh, talking about worship, 
it's a fun one to talk about. We're going to talk about some more next yeah, week. Yeah, can't wait. Um, but we're glad that y'all joined us uh, today for Digging Deeper podcast. Uh, don't forget, uh, if you haven't, to subscribe, like, comment, let us know uh, if you would bring a tambourine to worship. Um, would or you a cowbell or <laughs> yeah? Um, <laughs> Why uh, stop at tambourine? Would you be one of those people that pulls out the taser um, <laughs> to take care of it? Um, hopefully not. Uh, but. Let us know what you think about all these things. Uh, we'd love to, to hear from you in the comments. We're glad that you all joined us today. We'll see you next week.